Coming up on Tech Thing, the $9 chip PC is here and dead already. Internet of Things security devices, magic marketing, or the future of security, outrageous headphones, tiny PSUs, help with a used PC, and more, all coming up on Tech Thing. This episode of Tech Thing is brought to you by Lenovo. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patrick Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we make technology behave. At least on the good days. And yeah. Uh, actually, it, it's, well, we'll talk about it a little bit later on. Dude, it's been a good day. Just be excellent to each other. Well, Just a timeless excellent. classic of cinematic <laughs> excellent, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Jonathan writes, ask at techthing.com, did you get sick at DEF CON? And if yes, are you over it yet? From Jonathan. Thanks, I, dude. Did you get sick at DEF CON? I did not. I did not get sick at DEF CON. <laughs> I did blow my voice out Thursday night at CES. I was talking to a bunch of people at an event where a DJ was playing, DJ was oh, super no. loud. I didn't realize we were talking like this until my voice like cracked. Oh, and I started no. sounding like a 12 year old and my throat like started to, you know. I, I feel your pain. Uh, I wasn't quite at that point because I got to leave on Thursday night. <laughs> so I was like, yes, and I got to go home. So I ended up being fine this year. I brought lots of hand sanitizer, lots of water, and I drank all the water and I used all my hand sanitizer. So that's, I'm good. That's a big thing at CES, like washing your hands every yeah, chance you get. That's I don't, true. I don't know if hand sanitizer is a placebo or if it actually kills germs because I've, I've had friends who are in medicine argue both ways, but yeah. Pure L, man. Constantly, just even if it doesn't work, you, you want it to. Yes. Speaking of things that you want to work, even if they might not, one of the big trends at CES was <clears throat> the Internet of Things security devices. Ooh. I like to think of them as magic boxes that'll secure your network. Sometimes they're a router, sometimes they're something else you plug into your network. Shannon, you're the resident hacker. You buying this? Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, I saw several products there that promise to protect your home from hackers in one sense or another, usually by combining firewalls, antivirus, anti-malware into one handy updated physical device. So a couple of examples of this would be the Cujo. They were selling their product, well, they're going to sell their product. They were showing it off at CES. The Bitdefender box, which I'm sure y'all are familiar with the name Bitdefender. And Luma. So Luma's a little bit different. This one is a mesh networking router service. So hmm. this one combines several of those all in one. So I'm they, skeptical. So basically they're like, are they doing like stateful deep packet inspection? Is it like getting a full on corporate router and firewall going on your stuff? That's the thing is they don't quite explain what they do behind the back end. Like none of them give a really nice technical factual explanation of the details of their device's infrastructure. Yes. Some of them, as I talk to them in person, sure. they say, yeah, we're, we're, we have firewalls built in place, we have closed off ports, we have you know, yada, yada, yada. So a lot of them were able to explain it to me in person. Mm -hmm. But as a consumer, you're not gonna get that. You're not gonna get that one-on-one -on -one with the, the technical director of the company or anything like that. So how does it work with your existing antivirus? Do you have to take yeah. your existing antivirus? What if you do with a laptop? Does it work in a, you know? Yeah, if you have a laptop that's running antivirus, how is this going to work with that? Is it gonna break something in the middle? Like you don't know. Oh, you don't necessarily Well, you'll understand. find out after you, you spend. Are, are any of these under $200? I mean, what are the prices? Yes, these? so uh, the Cujo is going for 49 bucks right oh, now wow. if you back it on Indiegogo, but it will be 99 bucks. I believe the Bitdefender box is around $99 as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, 99 for a yearly subscription. Ooh. The box is free. Luma, you can get three of them for $249 or just one for 99 bucks at the moment. Of course, that price is going to go up. So some of these products, or do all of these products claim they can sort of block intrusions? So all of them say they can do something like that, but <laughs> what does that mean for heavy usage? This is a problem that I have. Can I open up my own ports? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. Will I be able to SSH or FTP or whatever I need into or my just, NAS box at or, work? Or what happens if it shuts down the ports for Minecraft? Yes, exactly. <laughs> like, I'm sure they won't, are, but... Those are serious questions I have. Like, oh, is, is it going to close off? Is it going to break those kind of things? And third, <laughs> give me the security specs. 
I really want those. Show me that you're a trustworthy company by being as open as you can be. Tell me, have they been audited? Is there a backdoor? How is that device being updated? What kind of information will be flowing through it? Because these are going to be plugged into my physical home router. Are all of my packets going through it? Are, do you have a revenue yes. stream that involves surveying what my family does and anonymizing <laughs> that information and selling it to a third party, a la some of the largest, biggest, hugest right? <coughs> Facebook, <coughs> Google, <coughs> everybody else and in the internet? And I'm assuming that all of my data will be passing through here so that you can protect my home service. Will my information be encrypted as it passes through your devices? Luckily, props to Cujo, who actually explains they're doing AES-256 encryption, which is great, yeah. but a lot of them don't even say what kind of encryption they're using. They, you have to sign up for a service. Is my password <laughs> going to be hashed on your website? What about my count? What if your servers are compromised? Like, I need to know this information. Are you being audited? That's really important, too. Do I have to create an account in the first place? How are you going to protect me? You know, I'd say paranoid much, but I think this is a legitimate, you know, this, this. <sighs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Right. You would think that I was being paranoid, but we After need to After the last ask. year. Yeah, we need to ask the right questions before purchasing another device for our households that's going to be connected, especially since they have access to our devices. Now, I'm not saying that any of these are not going to be doing what they propose. They might all be awesome, but yeah. statistically, in it my 20 be. years of reviewing computer products, not everything exactly. does what it says it's going to do. <laughs> so I am just saying, you got to ask the right questions. And if a company can truly stand yeah. behind their product, then they'll give you the best answers and offer security and convenience, because that's what it's all about, that's security and convenience. So maybe you think I'm being a bit hard on these companies, but hey, I think I have a right to be hard on these companies. I have, I have a right to be tough on them so that they get their products right, so that they are actually protecting us and they don't fall prey to a, a target of a hack. So they could work. They could. They're not being clear enough about what they're doing. Exactly. They're not being clear about whether or not they're being audited by third parties, which I think at this point should be standard for almost any Absolutely. device that claims to be secure. Although we trust, you know, we trust antivirus and any malware software that technically <laughs> isn't audited by third parties. I would like an all-encompassing security, I hate this word, solution. Solution. Solution, because it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's so co-opted by marketing at this point. But right. <laughs> and, and neither one of us are holding our breath. <sighs> yeah, I think that about clears it up. So that is my vent for the day. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. If you have some, some feedback or some input into these devices, yeah. or have you tried one at home and have you found a vulnerability, let me know. I'm very interested in these, mm -hmm. and it, I'm wondering if this is going to be something that solves the issue of security with Internet of Things, or if it's going to be something that furthers this problem even more. How about like a, a, a black hat DEF CON sort of like hack into the Internet of Things area? Dude, I think we should totally make that. We should make that a Internet of Things hacker village at DEF CON. That would be so funny. It's also really not, you know, that's another question. You know, do you think you can withstand a targeted assault by an aggressive and talented yep. hacking group? You never know. You never know. <laughs> Ask at techthing.com for your feedback, and we'll be right back. If you're a fan of Tech Thing, do us a favor. Make sure you subscribe to techthing.com on iTunes or YouTube.com slash techthing. You'll get each and every episode of the show. And if you want to take it to the next level and get our super cool build videos every month, take a look at patreon.com slash techthing. You can donate however much you want per episode, and seriously, every little bit counts. You'll get access to perks like our secret posts for patrons only and even a monthly hangout with us at the higher pledge levels. And we do a monthly build that only Patreon sponsors can get to. And if you can't donate, hey, we understand. Please take the time to send us your questions, your tips, share the show with your friends and family. And if you have a minute to review us on iTunes or any other podcasting, downloading kind of site, that would be a huge help. Thank you so much for supporting the show, no matter how you do it. Three questions answered, three reviews, three picks, all in three minutes. And this week's Rapid Fire Roundup is brought to you by Lenovo. Thank you, Lenovo. And it is the three most outrageous headphones that Patrick heard at CES. And I'm sure there were plenty more than just three. Are you ready? I am ready. Go! Like I said last week, I think the most amazing thing I heard at CES 26 thing was Elax Unify, incredibly affordable bookshelf speakers. Ridiculous sound for the money. That said, I got ears on some of the most outrageous headphones and earbuds around. Now remember, this tech trickles down to much more affordable stuff over time. Oh good. Or sometimes it doesn't, <laughs> but that's a whole other conversation.
Number, Number one. one. Shure's KSE 1500 electrostatic earphone system. This has been buzzing around the headphone world for years. These are $3,000 electrostatic Whoa. earbuds. Electrostatic uh, headphones are usually like the size of a uh, like a shoe box, a, 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 like the, the legendary wow. Stax ones. They're big yeah. little Kleenex boxes on the side of your the head. The big guys. Um, what's interesting about these, uh, part of one of the things I like about them so much uh, is they basically seal in your in ear canal for like 37 decibels of attenuation. So it blocks out wow. all of the outside noise. That's better actually than most earplugs you would take to the range or use in a machine shop. Yeah. Except there's electrostatic drivers inside of these. Um, there's a dedicated battery powered DAC and amp, which you'll need to run them uh, about 10 hours of battery life, which is not cheap. Uh, did I mention or $3,000. If you want something <laughs> pretty badass for considerably less money, Shure's SE846. These are, again, sound isolating earbuds, or earphones as they like to call them. Uh, four drivers inside of there, fantastic sound, a beautiful kick at the low end, wow. uh, a much more affordable $1,000, which is still a lot of money. Yeah. But, you know, if you spend a lot of time flying cross country and you have the wallet, you should go for it. Yeah, more Just money. Just throw that more money around. Well, yeah, there's, there's <laughs> so many headphones I heard. The thing you're looking at right here right now, this is uh, this is kind of a moonshot from Hi-Fi Man. This is their Shangri-La, uh, which is essentially their version of electrostatic headphones. That, this is the giant amplifier that comes with it. The price cool. will be announced uh, later this year when it ships. That's the actual electrostatic headphone. Now, Hi-Fi Man, of course, has been a big deal for me this year. They're doing planar magnetics. I finally got to hear the HE-1000, their, their $3,000 top of the line that, magnetic Okay, headphone. so that does say $3,000 That does say $3,000. I said these were expensive. Yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. They released, they announced the Edition X at CES, which takes a lot of the love from the 1000 and drops the price down to a so much more affordable $1,800. Okay. That said, I still think one of the most amazing bargains in headphones right now is the Hi-Fi Man HE-400S, which costs $299. Oh, okay. Well, it's, it's That's much more close to my price point. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes. I mean, look, if you're getting a new pair of headphones, like start with a, if you haven't ever had a decent pair of headphones, yeah. start with like a pair of Sony MDR7506s. They cost 75 bucks. They use them, professional audio engineers use them all the time. They're yeah. a wonderful start. Those are great. You know, I didn't get a chance to listen to Sennheiser's Orpheus. They're crazy, like, you know, $55,000, yeah. Talk about moonshots. Well, it's it's kind of crazy. On one hand, the original Orpheuses are still selling for like 20 grand. You know, yeah. you get this giant, I mean, in the case of the new ones, there's this massive piece of marble and a whole bunch of like discrete amplifiers for every channel in the over ears. Yeah. Um, those are pretty outrageous. That was something <laughs> they did like, we're gonna let, we're, we're a privately owned company and we're gonna let a bunch of our engineers make the most amazing thing they can oh make, no holds bars. I did not get to listen to those. I have a friend who chased are those, those headphones. No. Oh, okay. These are the HD 800S, that debuted at CES. The Orpheus, oh. a friend of mine, flew to three different continents just to get more listening time with it, out of his own pocket. What? And he says they're amazing. Other people are like, you know, they're good. Wow. They're not $55,000 good. And other people basically say they wept while they were listening to them. Some people get more into headphones than others. Apparently. The HD 800S, uh, this is the second generation or the, the update to one of the most legendary headphones that came out in the last 10 years, the HD 800, which was Sennheiser's top of the line headphone. This is a very different sound signature. I felt like it was a much more rock and roll headphone where the HD 800 is a very, very neutral headphone. Oh. Um, they come with like, you know, you know, a balanced XLR cable or a quad cable if you don't have balanced XLR out of your headphone app, because you know, I don't, and most people I know don't. <laughs> but again, this is a $1,700 headphone, right. and the technology inside of this is going to trickle down into other areas. I could go on, but I'm gonna wait for he the really outraged could. email, and we'll talk more about super inexpensive headphones and where to start with audio, if you care. And if you don't, that's okay. Yell at Patrick Norton on Twitter or on Facebook or email ask at techthing.com. The tiniest PC ever? Or I guess instead of going like this, I should say the tiniest PC ever. <laughs> I'm really curious about this guy. This is the $9 chip, correct? Yeah, so right before we split for CES, we got to see the Pi Zero, thanks to the generosity and sharingness of some of our Thank viewers. You and uh, emails, we'll get these back to you super quick. Um, so this is like the $5 PC from Raspberry Pi. The little guy. Which is really interesting, but more for embedded things than say using as a desktop. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the chip that I ordered earlier this year that just showed up this morning. So it's a one gigahertz all winter R8 Cortex A8 processor with Mali 400 graphics, uh, 512 megabytes of RAM, four gigs of storage, and a big 
big difference between this and the Raspberry Pis is that this has built-in 802.11 uh, BG and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 4.0. So there's a lot cool. of connectivity built into this so you don't end up stacking lots of things off of yeah. it. Uh, so more powerful than the Pi Zero. Uh, the onboard Wi-Fi, I'm going to say it again, is really, really nice. Um, one downside to this is it comes with a... Uh, <laughs> oh, it's so pretty. Yeah, it comes with a composite cable in the box. The HDMI adapter is not going to ship until spring with a lot of the other uh, chip accessories. Do you like composite? I, you know, I forgot how much I hate composite video. <laughs> I didn't have anything I could plug. I guess technically I could have plugged it into the back of my AVR and had the AVR scale it. Um, but I had to come into the office to find uh, an HDTV <laughs> with a composite input on it. Um, the documentation <laughs> and OS on this are still uh, really early adopter compared to the Raspberry Pi, which is super, super mature at yeah. this point. There's no manual in the box. There's limited information on the website outside the forums. And unless my search foo is completely broken, uh, you kind of need to get your GitHub on and compile the OS. Although I... Oh, fun. Well, it's kind of funny. I love compiling operating systems. I, I could be wrong. I'm learning a lot more uh, because, you know, it ran for about 15 minutes before the video died. Uh, I thought it might be a power issue uh, because it's, there's like three different ways to get power into the chip. Oh, um, okay. Right? Well, you can do it through the micro USB. Uh, you can do it, I believe, through this power adapter right here. It looks like a power adapter, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Um, and well, in it theory... Looks like a, yeah, it looks like a motherboard little power thingy. Exactly. Um, and there have been some power and heat issues. Uh, I contacted mm -hmm. Chip when this died, and they got an email back. It says, hey, Patrick, sorry to hear about your problems. It looks like you may need to reflash your chip to reinstall Debian. This should get it working for you. You can do it by following the instructions listed here. Uh, I just got this seconds ago. Should we yeah. see what it looks like? dun dun, -dun. Okay, so Docs. Gitchip.com. Ah, okay. Oh, wait. Cool. Install VirtualBox. Oh, okay. Oracle VM VirtualBox Extension Pack. Vagrant. Install Git. Clone the chip SDK repository. Boot the, the virtual commands. machine. Then we're going to SSH in. So it's a little less okay. newbie friendly than the Raspberry Pi. Definitely less newbie friendly, yeah. But more powerful. Uh, I will let you know next week what happens, and hopefully I will have it booted and running and we can demonstrate Yay! it. Yay! Let me know if you need help with the compiling operating systems and <laughs> stuff like that, because I, I can get geeky. <laughs> you can get geeky? I can get geeky. You? <laughs> really? <laughs> Shut up. This is news to me, ladies oh, and please. gentlemen. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> After our debacle of super high-priced headphones, no matter how much my ears love them, let us get thrifty. Frank writes in, hi Patrick and Shannon, I purchased a used computer and I wanted to know the best way to wipe it to ensure that no spyware is on it. It comes preloaded with Windows 8, so will a clean reinstall work or should I plan on buying a new hard drive? And if so, how should I install Windows on the new hard drive using a current copy of the Windows key? Anything else I should run, check, or do to ensure that my fancy new computer isn't phoning home? As always, keep up the good work, Frank. Yes. Okay, so I always like starting with new drives, especially if the computer has a regular right. rotating drive. So you will pretty much eliminate any chance of bad decisions by the old owner impacting mm -hmm. you if you actually do that. Right. Now, if it's a regular hard drive in there, upgrade to an SSD. And you will get like crazy awesome performance boots if you it's do that, especially when booting up. It'll be amazing. And then you can use the old and probably much bigger hard drive to store media after you've wiped it. Or you could always just buy a second new hard drive for your media and destroy the old one with thermite like we do. Or acid. Or acid. Or a drill press. Because it's super fun. <laughs> Drilling holes and drive. Well, it's kind of funny, right? Some some people are like, eh, I'll use it. And in, yeah. in some cases, some laptops where the, the storage is essentially soldered to the motherboard, you have no choice. Yes. You are using whatever was on there before. Yeah. Um, look, a clean reinstall is always a good idea. Uh, first of all, get the product key before you wipe the system. Yeah. Like write it down or take a photo or maybe write it down and then take a photo of it. Uh, you're going to need to create your ins Windows installation media. Right. Uh, you know, windows.microsoft.com slash en dash us slash windows 8. You know, the, basically the whole. Create, reset, reflash media. We'll put that link in the show notes. Yeah. And, and But it, you're going to laugh when I say this, but create your media. If you only have one computer, create your media and download all of the drivers you need to run the system or at least the Ethernet or Wi-Fi yes. driver before before you wipe the machine. Once you've got all of that ready to go, uh, format the drive and reinstall. Um, you know, you can get your Paranoid on and use DBAN or a similar security tool to write zeros and ones to the drive before you reinstall the OS. Uh, you know, adjust your reaction uh, to our general level of paranoia, which <laughs> yeah, is high. Pretty much. Because <laughs> we play with hackers 
and that leaves your level of paranoia high because you've been playing with hackers and all you see is the holes. <laughs> I generally don't buy used computers, but there's mm -hmm. there's no issue with it as long as you take the proper course of action for that right. hard drive or for that old solid state. Depending on what it is, just make sure that you reformat or just right. put in a brand new hard drive. Everything else should be completely fine. Yeah, in a lot of cases, you know, I mean, I buy used stuff all the time. Uh, I, I don't think I've, I've, like our last two air books were used. Oh, yeah. At home, and you know, we just basically told it to format and wipe, and everything's been good so far. Good. So far. So far. <laughs> Get my hacker paranoia on. So <laughs> far. You, however, could die squealing underneath the pile of terrible cold. Uh, nah, we're exaggerating because it's fun. It's like drama. It's like vegan. I gotta stop. I'm just rambling at this point. We'll be right back. <laughs> we got some viewer questions. The first one is from Nick. He says, hi, Patrick and Snubs. If you see any cool mini ITX cases, low profile coolers, and anything else appropriate for my next mini ITX build, please take a look at it for me from Nick. So uh, something I should point out, we talked about it uh, earlier this year, uh, my Not From Concentrate NFC S4 mini case showed up. I'll be Ooh. building that in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, as soon as I figure out where the Pico uh, power supply unit ended up, my 250 <laughs> watt power supply. So hopefully I'll have a core, like a core 7 6700 in this and a full size, well, 800, like sub 8 inch GPU. Awesome. Um, in terms of stuff at CES, one of the interesting things, uh, I got to go in the Corsair booth. A bunch of the booths I didn't have meetings pre-scheduled for and couldn't get in, oh, which yeah. is kind of a bummer, so I know that for next year. But um, Corsair was showing off the Bulldog, which is their living room gaming PC. Ooh. And if you take a look at that, um, some of the cool stuff, they developed a couple things to go inside of that. And if I scroll down, this SF600 power supply unit is super small. And what was even more awesome is the uh, CPU cooler that they're using inside of that, um, H55SF. Uh, and it is tiny. It's designed to basically sit inside of uh, what they call the small form factor liquid CPU cooler. It's designed for the Bulldog, but it'll fit in their carbide series, the 240 and the Obsidian series 250D. Pulls air from inside the chassis. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. Should be good to go for a 6700K. Okay. Um, that SF600 is a 600 watt uh, small form factor power supply unit, 80 plus gold efficient. Um, and both of those I thought were pretty slick and they're gonna be available. Um, basically they should be selling both that power supply and that cooler, the uh, liquid cooler separately, or you can actually okay. get the Bulldog chassis, the H5 SF liquid CPU cooler, and the SF600 power supply, that tiny power supply for 300 bucks with that Bulldog case. So if you're looking at the it's Bulldog case and thinking like, this is really cool, well, yeah, you have a path to build your own system if you don't want to buy a full system. Awesome. One last thing from the Corsair booth, this is the Lapdog, um, and oh, it's designed, yes. you basically, you, you bolt in your own, uh, Corsair keyboard, or it might be sold pre-configured with <laughs> keyboards. Cables go in this underneath this cover up front here. There's a big mousing surface, and uh, the foam on the bottom of this you can detach it. Because um, I like to, you know, have my keyboard centered and my mouse off to the side. Yeah. Because with the foam, the way it's set up to, you know, embed sort of in your lap. Yeah. Um, I actually found it really, it has a lot of potential. I like gaming in the living room because I have a 100 inch screen and, wow. well, I've got a projector, <laughs> right? So I've got like a 100 inch screen and surround sound. I awesome. think it's the perfect environment for, for gaming. Uh, and the lap dog is designed to go with the bulldog, uh, but you can, you'll be able to buy the lap dog separately. Those uh, are pretty. Those are pretty. <laughs> I laugh pretty Yay things. Yay to go Corsair. <laughs> and we got a message from Bill who said, hey Patrick and Shannon, thanks for presenting <laughs> tech stuff in such a fun way. Shannon, I have a little version of you at my home. Really? My daughter <laughs> jumps around the place just like you. It's uncanny. She loves anime and cosplay and J-pop, and she's clever and cute too. Aww. <laughs> anyway, I have a problem with the YouTube app. Is there a way to disable ads for the Android YouTube app? And if not, is there any way we can get Google to realize that some ads are offensive to certain people? Can they build in a category blocker for advertising into the app? I'll happily watch an ad for any anything else but gambling. Love your work. Cheers from Australia, from Bill. Thank so, you, Bill. So Bill was particularly offended by the fact that he's constantly getting gambling advertisements and he says where he's yeah. in Australia, gambling's a big issue, a uh, big issue, not issue, issue. Is that like a tissue? But Tissues. In any case, <laughs> The fundamental answer to this, and, and uh, I would say Eric, Raisin, Eric Raisincraft over at um, Lifehacker was a really great article on this, where he bought YouTube Red, which is their $10 a month makes all of the ads go away. 
But um, is that available in Australia yet? Unfortunately, it's not available in Australia yet. But it's kind of nice because then you get to support the people that are creating content for you, not using an ad blocker. Um, and you are getting the content you want with no ads. Um, even more unfortunate, while video creators can filter ads or block ads by mm -hmm. sensitive category, uh, end users really can't. Yeah. And because of the way they've engineered the app and the way actually YouTube is starting to, to force pre-rolls inside of the video itself, that is a response to ad blockers and YouTube and other, uh, uh, other websites frustration with ad blockers because ad blockers prevent them from making revenue and they need revenue to create, pay the people who create the content. So yes. short answer is no. Um, longer answer is hopefully YouTube Red will show up in Australia. I think it's, you know, to eliminate all of the ads on YouTube for $10 a month if you're a heavy YouTube consumer, I think is not a bad deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and C, you can experiment with using YouTube in a web browser and trying ad blockers, but YouTube knows what you're doing and are working really hard to make it more complicated to block ads. So that's pretty much where we're at. It would be nice and hopefully YouTube someday will be like, hey, you don't want to see ads from this? We won't show them to you because yeah. that will make the ads they do show you more valuable because people will actually potentially watch the ads, not be offended by them. That's an issue. That's also yes. part of the larger growth of advertising on video, which is a constantly changing and emerging category. That's like one of the only things I like about Facebook is the fact that when they show you an ad that you find offensive, you can mark it as offensive and they won't show you that ad anymore. At least they haven't in my, um, my experience. But I, I don't like I don't strawberries. Do that. <laughs> These strawberries, I find them very offensive. <laughs> we All joke, right. but we also understand not wanting to see ads for things that frustrate you and make you want to Absolutely. rage. <laughs> so remember, once in a while, maybe you're kind of sick of YouTube and you don't want to watch any more of our show. You can put away the phone. You can step away from the screen for a little bit and close the laptop. Do something fun and analog, like teach a little one how to play a really old board game that you used to play as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, like I recently played Connect Four with a little girl and it was so much fun. <laughs> I haven't played that game in like 25 years. And it was great. I had so much fun with her. Tell us what you would like to do wherever you live as well. We would love to feature your analog pic on the show. And you can even send us pictures and we'll feature those too. Or videos. Yeah, or videos. Just keep your clothes on. <laughs> I'm Patty Norton. I'm Shannon Moore. We'll see you next week on Tech Make. <laughs> you laugh. There's a reason I say that. Something we are super excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a blooper. <laughs> oh gosh. You can tell me afterwards. No, no, we will never speak of it again. Oh boy. <laughs> it was glorious. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Yeah. Ta-da. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Pi Zero project coming. Chip PC hopefully yes. running by next week. Yes. Very exciting. It These ran are so for cool. About 10 minutes and it stopped. I'm so happy you got it to run for about 10 minutes. It was glorious. <laughs> That's what you get out of a nine dollar piece. I really want HDMI <laughs> output on this. I'm gonna be so happy when the HDMI module shows up. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We got VCC 5 volts, VCC 3V3. I need freaking reading glasses. <gasps> I do need freaking reading glasses. Fracking. I can say fracking, right?